welcome back to the channel. Another interview for you today, and I'm very pleased to have got Stefano Suigo to come and talk to us. Stefano is a wonderfully inspiring language learner with a taste for the exotic when it comes to languages. A language high achiever if ever there was one, but someone who grew up, I think, in a monolingual community in Italy. Stefano is someone I know from language events, uh, for, uh, I've known for several years from different language events, so I'm very pleased to have him here on the show. Welcome, Stefano. Hi, Gareth. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Where are you at the moment? I'm in Finland. I'm escaping from high temperatures in uh, Central uh, Europe by spending the summer here in Finland. And you grew up in Italy. Which part of Italy are you from? I'm from Milan. And it was a, mono, a monoglot, uh, monoglot upbringing? Exactly, exactly. My whole family is uh, from Italy uh, and everybody else in my family speaks only Italian. Just like like one hundred percent. So, <laughs> but now you live in Belgium, in Brussels mainly, and you work as a That's... freelance translator and a language teacher. Exactly. Yes, so, correct, how yeah. does a kid who grew up monolingual in Milan get the language bug and end up working in two different language professions a few years down the line in Brussels? That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I guess um, already when I was when I went to school, it was clear for me that uh, English at the time was my uh, favorite subject, and then later on, uh, German came along, and it and I loved German like from the first day, uh, even more than than English. So. Uh, like I was, I think, 15 when I decided that I would become a translator or try and become a translator. So that was pretty early in, in my life when I decided what, what I would do in, in my life. So. And did you then go to university to specialize in translation for your first degree? Or Yes, yes. I went to um, a university called uh, Scuola Superiore per Interpreti e Traduttori, so both for <clears throat> translators and interpreters. At that time, um, you could still try both, um, like both jobs, before uh, deciding what to, to specialize in. And so I tried both and I, and I thought well, translation is more like my, my thing. And so I, I specialized in uh, translation in uh, Milan with a uh, Erasmus um, um, semester in Heidelberg in Germany, which turned out to be very like key uh, in, uh, in my life. Um, as far as languages is, uh, are concerned and, and, yeah, and the, the people that I met also turned out to be quite important in my life as well. <laughs> And they have the Dolmetscher Institute there, don't they? The interpreting school. Yes, well, exactly. So. EUD. Yeah. 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 Now, so when you were studying, I suppose you were in your late teens and your early 20s by this stage, were your foreign languages still English, just English and German? Or had you already started at this stage to learn other languages? I had had some Spanish uh, at school, at high school, uh, like three three years as a as a secondary uh, subject. So nothing really uh, special. And then uh, it was actually in Heidelberg, in Germany, that I started to uh, to learn Portuguese, and I like I fell completely in love with it. Uh, it was <laughs> actually uh, the uh, I, I think I learned more Portuguese in in Heidelberg than German, because <laughs> I was like obsessed. Uh, I had become obsessed with uh, with Portuguese, and it was there at the end of that uh, semester where. Like in six months, I had become able to speak Portuguese fluently that I decided, well, um, I think this is my this is the path, the right path. Uh, and um, it was there that I decided to to try with Finnish. And you were, you were still studying to uh, get the qualification in interpreting before we come on to the Finnish. So. After your Erasmus exchange in Heidelberg, you went back to Milan and graduated. And then were you qualified as a translator, um, German-Italian, or were you doing English as well? Or had you decided to specialise professionally in on German at that stage? No, no, I was using uh, all three languages, actually, yes, Portuguese yes, yes. as well, already from the, yes. from the start. After, after graduating, I, 
I had the bulk of my translations of my first translations were actually from and into Portuguese, which is pretty, yeah, striking actually um, uh, and unexpected. But that is something that I, I often say that without my Portuguese, I maybe I wouldn't have been able to um, uh, to earn a living and to continue on my uh, translator um, career. And I, maybe I would have had to to change, you know, to change job. And, you know, so thanks. Thanks to my Portuguese. That was uh, possible. That's what I think. So how did that happen then? If you if you've got a new paper qualification, you're waving it around on the streets of Milan. Uh, and you're saying, hey, I'm a German, English, Italian translator, and somebody gives you a job to translate from Portuguese. I'm not following. <laughs> uh, well, um, during the years in university, you meet a bunch of people, right? And, uh, and you, go, uh, you go to Germany and you meet a bunch of people there as well. And many, many of these people are uh, like... Um, work with languages or need translations or know somebody who uh, who maybe uh, are translators but have too much work and need somebody to to help them out sometimes this is how it works it's not nobody ever asked me what is on the paper nobody ever so, so it's, it's forming it's, contacts really in the language uh, industry for want of a better word or exactly yeah. the industry is key yeah yeah, yeah. Now, you said you'd initially in your course done some interpreting as well. So I suppose simultaneous and consecutive. Uh, exactly. Why did you choose to go for written translation rather than the verbal work as an interpreter? That's a great question. Um, I, I think that personality has, uh, plays a, a big, big role in this, in, in this thing. Uh, I prefer to um, to have the time to think about uh, what the best way to express something is, rather than just getting the message across. This has never really interested me so much, and that maybe is related also to my love for grammar and, and how languages actually work. In you know, um, not so much on the uh, spoken um, part of the of the equ equation, but uh, rather the, the the written one where it stays. It's also it's also a, a great feeling I have to say when you publish a book, and you have your name on it, and people are actually reading it, and they will be able to read it, like hopefully in many 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 years to come. And it's something that you have done, and it stays there. And uh, yeah, it's different from just speaking and forgetting. Does it really boil down to the divide between introverts and extroverts? I don't quite think so. Uh, that's a, a good, a good like um, uh, divide in general terms. But I do think that uh, there are extroverted uh, translators as well as introverted interpreters, and I've met some. And I'm, I consider myself extrovert and extrovert, so. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a translator, but I mean, I'm not so introverted. <laughs> well, let, let's come back a bit later in the conversation to the topic of careers in translation, because I think that's really interesting. And I want to ask you a bit later as well about how you got into teaching, because that's what you also do, language teaching. But before we get there, you mentioned that you had also become interested in Finnish when you were in Heidelberg. And so mm -hmm. since then... I assume, because I know you've often been in Finland and you're in Finland at the moment, have had an ongoing relationship with that country. Uh, was it the grammar then that attracted you to Finnish? How did you stumble upon Finnish uh, down the, the alleys uh, of Heidelberg? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question as well. Uh, it was w when I had uh, finished the Portuguese course and I was feeling like uh, unbeatable, because <laughs> it it had been quite easy for me to absorb Portuguese as a Romance language, probably. Uh, I wanted a new challenge and I wanted a very hard one. And uh, so I looked in the Internet for some of the most complicated languages in the world and I came across uh, Finnish and then I I looked up some texts in Finnish and I actually found found some words here and there that were that were hilarious. 
like hilarious, you know, uh, because they meant something in 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 Italian uh, that they obviously don't <laughs> don't mean in uh, in Finnish. And and so I decided to to give it a try, and then I discovered that that there are 15 cases. And after learning German, and actually, um, um, I won't say I like cases, but I, I do find case systems rather interesting and and fun to to crack the code, you know. So, uh, 15 cases. I was really wondering why uh, on earth do you need 15 cases in a language, and that's how it started. Um, I started looking into into Finnish from that perspective. When I started learning Finnish, and I have very basic Finnish, or I did have 20 years ago, one thing I noticed was that although the case system sounds very frightening, there are some ways that it's actually relatively simple. One is there's no gender, word gender, so you don't have different endings for the different genders uh, like you would have in Russian or German. Uh, another is, uh, I suppose, that it's the same endings on the adjectives and on the nouns. And right. so you've got stem changes, of course, um, but mm. generally it seems to be pretty regular. So in a way, you have to learn prepositions anyway in Italian or in English. And some of the cases are doing the same job. So perhaps it, once you got into it, it, it was something that you found actually wasn't as intimidating as it looked. Is, is the case system the hard bit of finish or is there something else which is more of a challenge? I think it's the um, consonant gradation, uh, which is which makes the case system actually. Yeah. Uh, I can say a nightmare because well, sometimes you, you have to uh, to look at it from from the outside. Now it's not uh, now it's normal for me, but actually from the outside it looks looks like a, a nightmare. So you have to to learn the the many 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 changes that occur in in words when you attach the cases yeah. and. Depending on the case, you change it in a different way many times. So, so I, I would say the case system itself, as you said, um, cannot be the most difficult thing. But um, I think the stem changes, so um, consonant gradation, actually makes it uh, really difficult. There are quite a lot of different verb forms as well, aren't there? Moving to the verb sort of the participle forms and so on uh, in Finnish. Uh, which yes, every every verb can be can can take um, an enormous amount of, of forms. They become relatively uh, logical when you when you when you are inside the language, but when you look at it from from the outside again, uh, it can be really intimidating. And um, yeah, um, and I think and I think even in um, as as far as verbs are concerned, uh, consonant gradation actually applies so this makes makes them as well difficult even though i didn't really consider verbs uh, as the most uh, the most uh, challenging part of finnish i think nouns are more uh, more difficult than, than verbs uh, and then you have the uh, in terms of the um, phonetics of the language or the phonology, you have the long and short vowels and then the, mm -hmm. the long consonants as well, uh, which yes, is a distinction tongue. that I don't know that you have in Italian, we don't have in English. So it turns out this in Japanese as well, actually, I'm discovering yeah. at the moment. Yeah, Japanese, Italian has them. So for me, uh, that was no problem whatsoever, actually, because we have double consonants as well in Italian. Uh, and uh, as far as the vowels are concerned, it's, you, you can get used to, to them pretty pretty yeah. quickly, I think. Yeah. So, for example, is it, I can remember, is it, there's Kula and Kula, and one means yes, and the other one means a village or something like that. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Kula yeah. is a village and Kula is yes. So that's the distinction, basically. Can you hear it? Uh, can you... Uh, yes, I can hear it, but uh, <laughs> it's sort of, you sort of pause, don't you, almost? You don't really lengthen because, to my mind, you can't lengthen a consonant. You know, it's no, a burst that's of correct. air. I think so. It's actually a you, pause. You can do that with vowels, but not yes, with consonants. it's a pause yeah. before you before you say yeah. the consonant. The consonant. So, um, so there are things. My trick, if yeah. I can say, my, yeah. my what my trick is is just to consider the double consonant with the hyphen uh, in the middle, and and uh, you know double double it because it, it, 
considering the the the, the two syllables separated. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a good way of thinking of it. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's yeah. of other of other languages too that use it. So when you started Finnish, we were already, you said, in the internet age, which is a distinction between yeah. your time in Heidelberg and mine. <laughs> uh, oh. uh, but um, did you have a textbook then? Did you get, do you like to use a textbook when you're learning a language? Yes, absolutely. Uh, my, text, my textbook at the time was a, a horrible, horrible <laughs> um, Italian text. Uh, from the was it from the 70s or from the 60s so really old and it contained only grammar it was really uh, it, it was what I was looking for and I think it was at the time the only grammar book that I had found in the, the biggest library in uh, I'm sorry bookstore in uh, in Milan at that time so I had no choice and it was a good choice for me and how long did it take you to get re get a good working knowledge of Finnish? Uh, and when did you go to the country? Could you already speak the language when you arrived for the first time? Uh, I didn't. The first time I didn't. I just visited for a couple of days and um, I didn't know much of the language at all. Um, but uh, I would say like two years or three years to, to get to an intermediate level and then I normally I say between four and five years of actual study to become fluent in it and then after that I've been I, I, like I've stopped learning like actively stopped studying and I, but I continued uh, I have continued to, to learn like uh, passively and I continue to learn today as well I mean you know how it is and you do you're translate. always you're, you do Sorry? translation work as well uh, from as well, Finnish yeah, into Italian. As well. Yes. yes. So reading reading uh, novels really helps uh, to learn vocabulary, and uh, having to translate one, you can imagine how how challenging it, it can be. Would you say that for you in general, obviously if you're learning a language which is close to one that you know already, so you mentioned Portuguese, but I suppose if you were going to learn Estonian now as a fluent Finnish speaker, things would go more quickly. If you're starting with a fresh uh, alien language, uh, would you say that four to five years is the normal time scale or have you got quicker as you have uh, got more experienced as a language learner? I would say it depends enormously on on the language, of course, as you as you mentioned, and uh, I think you can get to you can shor shorten that time to maybe two years for languages that are closer to to your to your own mother tongue or to another language that you already speak fluently. Uh, I do think that my Romanian now is quite fluent, but I'm sure I could have become really, really fluent in, in Romanian in just two years instead of three or three and a half, if I had put more time and if I had like maybe focused only on Romanian instead of learning like Icelandic, Chinese and Georgian at the same time. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it also it also depends on what other languages or, or what other things you are doing in your life. I suppose when you started learning Finnish, you were still younger. I suppose you uh, didn't you didn't have children at that stage uh, you had right. more time as you've gone on obviously then you have a family now and one gets busier and busier I suppose have you found it increasingly difficult to find time to learn languages or how has the way you learn changed over the last uh, the last I don't know 15 years or so for example absolutely that's a great question as well uh, like um when when time becomes less and less you you have to become more um effective in language learning you have to otherwise you're you have no uh you cannot have success um so developed uh, ways to make my uh study time much more effective than it was before um yeah, that's that's a short the, the short answer. Uh, uh, and what are those ways? <laughs> that's what everybody wants to know. <laughs> yeah. Um, first of all, absolute concentration. When I, I I don't think that 
that I was not as concentrated when I when I was working on uh, on my languages before, but uh, maybe I was doing more of the not so useful stuff. Whereas now I really concentrate only on super useful things uh, like useful vocabulary or the things that I notice that I tend to say uh, a lot that I tend to use a lot to express myself. Uh, so these are the expressions and the words that I'm going to, uh, to look to, to, to learn uh, at, a, at an early stage. This kind of um, things. And do you set aside a regular time each day uh, for a study slot with your languages or do you just have to fit it in when you can? It would be nice. Uh, to be as disciplined uh, as, as you said, but no, um, there's really much less discipline in my uh, language studies than, um, than you would think. I try to make the time every day if possible, but when this time is, uh, or when this time comes, comes about, I have no idea, usually, and every day is different. As I have uh, students, um, on my schedule, uh, I mean lessons that I have to to make. Um, every every time, every day, they are at a different time. So, yeah, um, there's almost no discipline in my in my le uh, learning experience. Uh, but but this is something very important that I want to tell you. I'm actually e even when I'm not studying, I'm revising things in my head you know uh, I do a lot of talking to myself the things that we do everybody does that you know uh, think about what you have to do today or tomorrow or, or problems that that uh, bug you in some way I try to do this activity in a, in, a, in a foreign language and that helps a lot to use the language even even when you don't have actual actual uh, speakers to to talk to now, you mentioned that you're learning Georgian, and that's your current project. I know that from your YouTube channel. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but you've also mentioned some other languages. So what's the sequence then? We've taken the story you to finish, and then what happens? Yeah. How have you picked up other languages? You know, which ones since then? So after finish, it, it was the time... Uh, that's when I, I think that's, oh yeah, Japanese, because I, for a certain, for a certain amount of time, I was learning Finnish and Japanese at the same time, which is why, uh, most of my, yeah, <laughs> most of my friends at university thought I was crazy. I don't know what you think, but <laughs> I think you're crazy. <laughs> yes. and I mean, you are learning Japanese and Basque yeah, at the same time. Yeah, I mean, it's, there's not a great difference there. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but with Japanese, the story with Japanese was that I actually stopped um, learning it for for a for for a long time and many times. I've had uh, stretches of two to three years without even looking at a kanji. So uh, that's the language that I have abandoned and and taken back most uh, in, in my life, like at least two or three times. Um, yeah, until 2000, and was it 15, maybe, where I decided, look, um, if you want to do something with Japanese, you have to, to be serious about it. And, um, and that's where I started to actually try and look for speakers to talk to in order to activate my, um, um, my, uh, um, my skills as a speaker rather than just reading and, and writing, which I had done before. Did you start learning? So, uh, yeah. Did you start learning the kanji, so the Chinese characters in Japanese, right at the beginning, or did you wait until you'd got the basics of the language before you turned to those? Right at the beginning, yeah. uh, but not in a in an obsessive way. I mean, just just um, the basic kanji that you encounter in the first units of a textbook, for example, or when there's if if there's a, a word that you like because. That's something that you you just like, I don't know, your hobby or your your job. Uh, I would learn those kanji, so the, the kanji of my speech or what I wanted to say and to read about. 
Uh, but and did you learn the kana, so the hiragana and the katakana sil uh, syllable is uh, right at the beginning? They're much quicker to learn. Yes, of uh, course, yeah. of course, of yeah. course. Yes, yeah. so that that was actually the um, the thing that interested me most uh, the most about Japanese was the. the the, the hiragana actually i found it so beautiful that I, I absolutely wanted to be able to to write like that myself and i had seen them obviously in the anime in the uh, back in the 80s and and 90s uh, when i was watching tv as a as a child or as a young man and um, yeah uh, so that that's why that's why i actually wanted absolutely to to learn some japanese because of because of the, the script and what sort of level would you say your Japanese was at now? Oh, uh, well, Japanese uh, Japanese level is difficult to um, to say. I would say like N2, I should be able to pass the N2 uh, examination. I've never done any, any of those and, and I don't plan to, but I was told by tutors and uh, teachers that uh, I should be easy, easily able to pass N2. And two, I don't, I don't know about the word easily, but uh, yeah. <laughs> and so that's is that equivalent to what would that be on the common European framework of? I, I think it, it should be should be uh, between B1 and B2 yeah. uh, in yeah. in the CEFR. So a very yeah. solid intermediate level Japanese. Yes, then. yes, yes, yeah. 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 <laughs>